Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight... What type of leadership do we want of our teachers? Chicago Teachers Union leadership is facing competition from within the ranks. It's an absolute necessity in our fight against gangs. A plan to go after gang profits, the ongoing remap fight, and much more. A panel of older people weigh in ahead of the year's first city council meeting. There will be enormous consequences. President Biden warns Russia's President Vladimir Putin against invading Ukraine. National declines in higher education enrollment. We check in with local institutions to hear about their admissions. A look at Chicago from hundreds of miles above. We'll tell you where this unique video came from. The craft beer community is, it, it's, it's one of those communities, there's literally something for everyone. Meet a Chicago brewer hoping to make the craft beer industry more inclusive, one drink at a time. And Jeffrey Bayer on the history of the Schwinn Bicycle Company in Chicago. That's in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. But first, some of today's top stories. Anti-violence groups are calling on the city to provide more mental health resources for families impacted by gun violence. Hustle Mommies, an organization aimed at helping single mothers fight gun violence, and state lawmaker LaShawn Ford met with families of gun violence victims today. Here's the mother of a four-year-old fatally shot over Labor Day weekend while getting his hair braided. Whoever decided it was a good day to come in that community and do a drive-by and shoot 27 bullets into the house, and two of them struck my son. It's been over 140 days since my son was murdered. We have no justice for my boy. We have no arrests made in his case and no advancements on the investigation. There has to be resources in place because right now I had to uproot and relocate to Chicago to help and assist with his investigation. I have not been able to properly grieve my son because every single day I have to get up and go to work for him. And city data shows 19,400 Chicago Public School students are currently in quarantine. It's the highest number since the pandemic began. An additional 809 staff members are also home in isolation or under quarantine. Still, school CEO Pedro Martinez says cases are on a steady decline. CPS has been criticized in recent days for not telling students and families that it changed the way it reports positive cases among students and staff in school on its online dashboard. Martinez says there was no ill intent. One of the things we're looking at now is, okay, how do we, you know, what are there strategies that we can try to maximize accuracy while still making sure that we're providing complete and relevant data to our families? So one, for example, we're looking at is, can we separate the self-reporting from the actual screening tests, you know, that we do on a weekly basis. Martinez also announces that beginning February 1st, CPS will begin, will be following CDC guidance and shortening the required quarantine time from 10 days to five. The famous Little Village Arch is set to become an official landmark. A final vote by the Chicago City Council is set for Wednesday after the council's zoning committee unanimously recommended the official designation today. The two-story stucco arch designed by architect Adrian Lozano welcomes visitors and residents to the neighborhood, also known as La Villita. Up next, the fight for the future of the Chicago Teachers Union. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Fresh from a standoff with the city where some 25,000 Chicago teachers didn't report to their classrooms, CTU leadership has another fight on its hands. This one from within its own ranks. Amanda Venicky joins us now with more. Amanda, what's going on? Well, Brandis, 2022 is a year with a whole lot of elections. You have congressional contests nationwide, the governor's race heating up here in Illinois, but also the Chicago Teachers Union leadership up for re-election. It's a contest that takes place once every three years, and this time they've got competition. The members' first slate debuted today with this produced digital ad. Having a union that delivers for us is essential, but that just isn't what we have today. The current leadership of the CTU sees work stoppages and strikes 
As the first step and not the last one, they are far more focused on being in front of the camera and advancing their own political careers than delivering for us. An apparent not so veiled reference to CTU's current vice president, Stacey Davis Gates. Her name frequently comes up as a contender for mayor. Now, when asked about her political aspirations earlier this month on Chicago Tonight, right here, Davis Gates did not rule it out flat. Right now, I'm focused on continuing to serve our membership and giving Chicago students the schools they deserve. I did speak with Davis Gates this afternoon. She declined to talk via Zoom, but we chatted for a while, and she said that she is currently focused on her two job, raising three CPS students, her own children, and serving union members in her current role with the CTU. She says that this is an inner squad scrimmage, and in the end, everyone's on the same team. She also spent a lot of time talking about all that the union has accomplished recently, including securing a moratorium on school closures, filling in gaps during the pandemic with mutual aid efforts, negotiating resources for homeless youth, and a contract that will put nurses in every school, becoming, she says, a major force in this city and state's progressive politics. Now, much of those accomplishments came after tense and bitter standoffs with the mayor's office, including work actions that have led to canceled school each of the past three years. There is no love lost between the CTU and the mayor. Gates recently said that Lightfoot is on a kamikaze mission to destroy CPS. Now, those looking to win control of CTU say that they oppose that combative style. As teachers, we should be able to teach our students enough uh, by example how we find solutions without attacking uh, others, without using, um, you know, harmful rhetoric. Uh, I don't want to be that type of example. It says, there's my teacher, you know, there's somebody that is collaborating, there's somebody that is finding a solution, and does it in a professional way. Fray Jimenez is a CPS high school civics teacher, and he is part of the members for Slate. The caucus's candidate for president is Mary Esposito Yersterbowski, and she was an elementary teacher, now a district-wide psychologist for CPS. She frequently brings up collaboration. We need to work collaboratively with all parties. Parents need a, a seat at that table. We need to work together to improve learning conditions for children and, and working conditions for our members. Because if our members' working conditions are good, we know that directly impacts um, our students' learning. When I specifically asked whether that spirit of collaboration needs to extend to the mayor's office, she said, our goal is to work collaboratively with all stakeholders. Now, Esposito Rostrobowski is currently serving on CTU's governing board. She was elected three years ago as part of the Members First Caucus. She praises guarantees in the current contract, but is unsatisfied with this month's work stoppage over COVID safety and its end result. Our teachers have to fight for every single thing that they need. Um, and members shouldn't be have to take four days off of work to get basic safety precautions in place. And that's just one example. Could we have done better for our members? Could we have done better for our students? You know, this last agreement uh, basically was uh, sacrificing time and effort and for not much. At this point, though it is subject to change, teachers will not be paid for the four days of missed school if they did not show up during that work stoppage. By the way, this election is different from the others I referenced initially. It is internal. And so we don't have the same access to, say, who is funding these campaigns. Union rules are still being finalized for this election cycle, but they call for donations only from CTU members. Campaigning is underway now for what will be a May election, and only the CTU's approximately 28,000 members are going to be able to elect the union's new leadership. But of course, the result of that is going to have an impact citywide. Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to Paris with some older people ahead of city council's first meeting of the year. Paris. 
Brandis, Chicago City Council meets tomorrow for the first time this year, and its members still have yet to strike a deal on redrawing the city's ward maps. They're also contending with a controversial ordinance backed by Mayor Lori Lightfoot to go after street gangs' profits and assets. And the city's watchdog recently released two reports on a botched smokestack demolition and a wrongful police raid, even though the city is still without a permanent inspector general. And joining us to discuss all of these issues and more are Alderman Byron Sigcho Lopez of the 25th Ward on the West Side, Alderman Jason Irvin of the West Side 28th Ward and who chairs the Black Caucus, Alderman Gilbert Viegas of the Northwest Side 36th Ward and who chairs the Latino Caucus, and Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor of the 20th Ward on the South Side. Welcome all of you back to Chicago tonight. Let's start with that controversial gang asset forfeiture ordinance that the mayor has pushed. Here's what she had to say about it yesterday. If we go after the profit motive, we're going to reduce the incentive uh, for uh, the gangs. We're going to induce, uh, reduce their ability to buy uh, illegal guns um, and use their profits to continue to further uh, their business. We had, I think, a, a productive uh, subject matter hearing on this issue on Friday, and I look forward to moving the ordinance forward uh, for a vote in its passage so that we can then use this as another tool in our fight against gangs. So this ordinance would empower the city to go after gang mes members' assets and find them. Alderman Irvin, are you in support of this? Yes, I'm actually I'm in support of this particular ordinance. Uh, this uh, legislation and this authority already exist at the uh, at the state level for the state's attorney to execute. However, it has not been executed uh, by the state's attorney here locally uh, in a while. I'm giving the city the authority to also act when we feel is necessary. I think it's in the best interest of the city and all of our all concern. Alderman Viegas, uh, there were a, a, a group of attorneys that said that this is fraught with problems, uh, namely it would target black and brown communities disproportionately and result in potentially costly litigation for the city. Are these fair points? Um, I think anytime you get uh, the ACLU and all these organizations together and, and, and agreeing on one issue, I think it does give us some pause. But what you're seeing is uh, crime in the city of Chicago uh, has been out of control, uh, and we need to figure, figure ways uh, to provide uh, the city uh, with enough tools to address this issue. Uh, is it a perfect piece of legislation? No. Uh, but I think that uh, we'll be able to try to figure this out. Alderman Sigcho Lopez, uh, what about you? Does this have a majority of council members in support of it? Well, I hope not. I, I hope that we are looking for strategies that are based on evidence, based on what we know works. Uh, there's a number of holes in these uh, ordinance, including uh, empowering corporation council or making these decisions. Uh, there's a number of things that are, are not going to prevent more crime. We've seen the statistics are tragic and, and sad. Uh, we need to change directions. Uh, this no nostalgia or going back to the Reagan years is not going to help us. We need to invest more in prevention. We need to invest more in addressing the root causes of uh, violence. And certainly something on Mayor Lightfoot has delayed for way too long. It's time to change our courses. And this is certainly, uh, and I'm glad that the, com the, the committee did not move forward with a vote. I, I think that signals that we do not have the vote. And I hope that our council looks for different strategies to prevent more crimes. So it's delayed for now. Alderwoman Taylor, do you believe that this should be part of a strategy to bring the homicide rate down and crime overall down in the city by going after suspected gang members' assets? No, this is a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. When you take care of people, they don't do illegal things. And so we have the money and the means to invest in people in our community. Why are we not investing in human infrastructure? People don't sell drugs and do illegal things if they can make a living wage, if they have safe places to be. And so we have not provided that at the city, but we said he want to blame the victim. And so this gets a no for me. And people are voting on this. I actually vote against the people that we're fighting to help in the community. So we'll get basic income, but then turn around and say, let's lock you up for trying to live and survive. And so there has to be a balance. But this is not just the city hall problem. This is the county, the state. We all need to be working together to figure this out. And we, it needs to be evidence-based, not what you cooked up in your backyard or at a cookout. This, we actually have to use the data and the research. Alderman Irvin, since you are in support of this, I want to ask you, you know, the gang database has had problems. People wind up on this database, but they're not actually part of any gang. Couldn't that be a problem here with this gang asset forfeiture law? It, it very well could be a problem, but I think the steps that are being done to uh, recreate and clean up the database 
I believe will help move us in the right direction. And I do I want to just say this. I do agree with my colleagues, both for Alderman Cincho Lopez and Alderman Taylor, as it relates to doing uh, more than one thing at one time. I think that we have to uh, work toward creating a better opportunities for people, but at the same time, we also have to deal with those who are uh, on the wrong side of the law in the manner in which they need to be dealt with. And I don't believe, and I do believe that we can do both uh, at the same time. So I think we have to you know, look at both aspects and work from it at that standpoint. And speaking of doing multiple things at the same time, Alderwoman Taylor, I'm sure you saw that Sun-Times report quoting top police brass saying the department has lost confidence in police superintendent David Brown. He's saying it's just a disgruntled few employees that don't want reform the police department. Do you believe that uh, he has lost faith uh, of his top commanders? How? He, he came, it's, it's the same thing with the mayor. They came, they came in where there was chaos already created. I think he has to do a better job with working with the people in the community to ask what is the need is. But let's not act like this ain't 50, 60 years of disgrace. And they didn't need Superintendent Brown to make the police make them look bad. The actions that they do and don't do and their unwillingness to work with the community shows that. And all this man inherited this. Alderman Cinco Lopez, the mayor, is backing him. Uh, should should he keep his job as CPD superintendent? Well, we, we've seen, uh, unfortunately, the the same culture, the lack of accountability, and the frustration, you know, among uh, the de within the members of the department, and but citywide, uh, we we really need to focus on uh, the civilian oversight that we passed uh, last year. We need to make sure that we have uh, accountability within each department with this, uh, in the city of Chicago. We continue to see that in the, in the Chicago Police Department, the number of, uh, of cases that continue to be uh, coming uh, for settlements, millionaire settlements, are an embarrassment to the city of Chicago and certainly have not uh, uh, make a safer city. So I certainly join the efforts for accountability and changes uh, in the leadership uh, because the, the level of crime, the level of tragedies in our community is just simply unacceptable. Alderman V, I guess I want to switch gears to another topic. A couple of big uh, inspector general reports have been released recently, one of them concerning the botched police raid of the home of Anjanette Young and the mayor's according to this report, botched response to it, the mayor will not release this full report. Should she do that, given that she campaigned on transparency? Absolutely. I think the more that you're not transparent, it just gives, it feeds, uh, fuels the fire of, uh, of government trying to hide something. Look, uh, this, is a, this is something that didn't happen under her watch. Uh, she should just go ahead and, and bring out the report, whether it's the report on Anjanette Young, whether it's the report at, at, the, uh, at, the, at the demolition site. I mean, anything that's transparent. You're referring have, to Hilco in Little Village. Well, we have to bring confidence uh, to, the, to, the, to the residents of the city of Chicago, and there's nothing, uh, nothing that uh, is better than um, bringing light to something. Speaking of bringing light, Alderman Irvin, this comes as uh, the city council still has not filled and the mayor as well. They've not filled that role of inspector general since uh, Joe Ferguson stepped down in the fall. He gave ample time. Why is there no replacement yet? And why are we hearing anything about it? You know what? Uh, that's not a question really for the council uh, to answer. There's a process that's in place. Uh, that process needs to be followed so that we can have an inspector general. And uh, that process does not begin in council. So we, we need to make sure that the process is moving forward and that we get a new inspector general in, uh, in decent time. Well, as I understand, the council does have a role. I mean, they, they select finalists, and, the, and then the mayor selects from that, uh, older woman Jeanette Taylor. Is there any progress on filling that position? Not that I've seen and not that I know of. Um, we, there are a bunch of moving pieces to this. And so I don't want them to rush to just put anybody in the seat because we've seen that hasn't been effective and it hasn't worked for the citizens that we're paid to represent. And so I would rather for them to take longer and do a thorough job than just pick anybody and then we have another mess. There's been an interim uh, William Marbeck in there for several months now. I want to move on to the remap. Alderman Sigcho Lopez, it appears that the map supported by the Black Caucus and the Rules Committee has more signatories at this point. Can you just take us uh, into the negotiations that are happening right now? Well, certainly we, um, we see with uh, uh, with the different caucuses, the proposals that I have uh, put forward, the Latino caucus has a proposal, the Black caucus and the Rules Committee have a proposal. And uh, ultimately, what we want to make sure is that this represents the best interest of our constituents. Uh, we certainly hope 
that there's still room for uh, for a compromise but i do think that is important for the sake of our constituents to have more public meetings more participation that we need of course to make sure that this remap is taken seriously so we we hope that there's enough time for a compromise for fair representation especially now when we see with great concern what's happening nationwide the suppre the, the suppression of voting rights and the many issues we hope here in the city of chicago we uh we guarantee and we respect the census so that we have fair representation for both communities for the black community and also for the latino community and i hope that that's a priority i hope that there's room for an agreement otherwise we'll go to a referendum alderman uh, uh, viegas you've led the charge on the latino map which as i mentioned at this point seems to have fewer signatories in city council than the black caucus map what's what's the end game here well i think what the, the end game well first of all it's called the coalition map because we've been able to get some other folks besides just Latinos. But, um, you know, this this Friday, there'll be a, uh, a meeting uh, of delegates from both caucuses to speak to try to figure out if there's an opportunity to get there. Uh, look, we, we, we've we been very consistent on making sure that we've been following the data, the Voting Rights Act, as well as listening to the residents of Chicago. And, and that's what we've done based on hearings. Uh, and so I hope that we're, there's an opportunity to get there. But if not, ultimately, there's the, uh, the referendum. And that would uh, come in June, so still a few months to uh, come to a deal on that. And we're going to have to leave it right there. Our thanks to Alderman Byron, Sigjo Lopez, Jason Irvin, Gilbert Viegas, and Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor. Thanks so much. Thank you. And up next, some colleges are seeing a decline in enrollment. A look at some of the reasons why right after this. Thousands of Puerto Ricans are taking to the streets to protest massive blackouts. Over the years, Mexican culture, from food to music, has become woven into the city's tapestry. Medical professionals share the latest recommendations on COVID-19 booster shots. DACA recipients have been facing longer delays than normal in their status renewal. Little Village is one of my favorite neighborhoods. This neighborhood comes together to celebrate such an important day in our culture. College students are still not returning to classes virtually or in person at their pre-pandemic levels. National data shows college enrollment fell another 2.7 percent in the fall of 2021. It's a bit larger than the previous fall when institutions saw a 2.5 percent drop. Joining us now with more are Michelle Brown, Director of Admission and Enrollment at Oakton Community College. Anish Sahoni, CEO of One Million Degrees, a nonprofit aimed at helping Chicago area low income students graduate from community college, and Oscar Rodriguez, Associate Vice, Pres Vice Provost at the University of Illinois Chicago. Thanks to the three of you for joining us. Um, so, Michelle, let's start with you, please. We know that Oakton has seen a decline in enrollment since 2019 from 7,600 in 2019 to 6,200 in the year 2021. And this is a national trend as well with community colleges having been uh, specifically hit hard, public two-year colleges at 1.4% uh, in 2019, that was a decline that year, down 10% in the year 2020, and uh, last year, 2021, down 3.4%. Michelle, to what do you attribute all of this? Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, Oakton's enrollment in recent years has been declining, although it is in line with the national trends for community colleges. Our population in Illinois, especially amongst younger people, is declining, and that is impacting us with fewer students to serve. Some of our challenges are the students have stopped out because of the pandemic, and the pandemic has impacted their personal lives with children, child care, elder family care, financial um, impacts that have impacted their ability to return to school or continue their education. And Anish, of course, uh, one million degrees, you all work with uh, community college students to help them persist and, and complete community college. What are some of the needs of the students that you work with? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing we've learned in doing this work is that you really need to wrap your arms around the student and really provide that community of support that students need. So for the scholars that we work with, we provide this relationship-based support to really help students navigate their academic and personal journeys. We provide financial support uh, to really support students with any needs that might emerge. 
academic tutoring to really ensure that they're getting the extra support they might need uh, to stay on track with their classes. And then we also provide a professional network of uh, people in the field of interest that they might be going down or another sector where they can really learn what it's like to both be in college, but also be in the workforce. And I think the biggest takeaway we have is the wraparound and ecosystem supports that we're able to provide have always been necessary for our students, but especially in the last two years during the pandemic, that community has been more important than ever. Now, Oscar, it's, it's a bit different for you all at UIC. You've actually seen an increase in enrollment with over 33,000 uh, in 2019, up to over 34,000 this year. To what do you attribute this increase? Uh, we, we've been fortunate. Uh, the, uh, a handful of years ago, we, we had uh, redecided how it, we rethought how we were going to approach admissions and recruitment at UIC. And um, that, and combined with the, um, with the location here in Chicago, has simply been uh, a benefit to us. Um, for, for us, location with the academic reputation that the institution has, and then uh, students being able to, to choose whether or not they're going to live on campus, live in the community, or perhaps live in live at home with their parents has provided us a great deal of flexibility in terms of the kinds of students that we can attract to campus. Um, so you, know, you, you put together sort of that, uh, that, that, that top tier sort of research institution with the academic reputation and um, try, trying to, to reach students where they're at and, and trying to share with them who and what we are uh, has been uh, pretty successful for us at UIC. And Michelle Brown, how has Oakton had to adapt programs and classes during the pandemic? Thanks for asking. At Oakton, we've continued to add new programs to respond to the local workforce needs. Uh, an example of some of the new programs include things like our sterile processing technician, our cannabis cultivation program, which is the first in Illinois, our modern manufacturing program, and our import export specialist program, which is addressing the supply chain issues. We also help students by offering technology loan programs to support their remote learning with Wi-Fi and hotspots and Chromebooks. We have also given financial support to students. We have a three free credit hour initiative we've given students in the fall and are continuing to offer in the spring to help them with their tuition. And we've received federal stimulus funds that we've passed on to students awarding over $4.6 million for students to help pay for educational costs and expenses. And Michelle, has the, the lowered enrollment itself, you know, has that had any impact on the programming that you're able to offer? The lower enrollment is impacting our students, but we do expect that many will return to their same levels of academic uh, um, in-classroom um, participation once we, we return to the pre-pandemic levels of in-person learning. We have heard from our students that they do not prefer the online learning. They do want to return to the classroom, and so we're looking forward to having them return and are actually going to have some great opportunities for students to still enroll in Oakton classes this semester with some late start classes offered throughout the semester and opportunities for students to still register, apply, and get enrolled in those classes. Um, and Anish, you know, you talked about, of course, like the kind of support that you all are able to provide to community college students, but how have you seen uh, the pandemic impact community college students? How has it changed uh, their educational careers? Yeah, I think the key has been for us, at least in working with our students, to really listen and understand their needs and then to be flexible and responsive to what we're hearing. So one thing we know for sure is that there is no kind of one common need for any of our students. And so being frequently in touch with our students via text messaging and really checking in on them to see what might be going on for them has been important. Um, second, you know, we mentioned you mentioned the importance of thinking about the pandemic context needs for groceries and resources for medical care and housing have continued to be a high priority for our students. And so we've been really focused on providing emergency grants and supports to provide the holistic need of supports that our students might have as well. And equally as important, I think, cutting down some of the processes that are oftentimes required to get access to funding and really saying, you know, we know you have the need, let's get the resources to you as quickly as possible. Uh, and then similar to Michelle, you know, I think one of the things we're realizing is there's a lot you can do to support students in a virtual environment, especially on some of the one-on-one -on -one communications. And we've been able to have more frequent touch points as a result. But what's harder is to build that community virtually as well. And so while we're figuring out what this looks like as we move forward in the pandemic, we know that building community and having some of those in-person touch points, we'll need to get back to that because that's a critical part 
of our students being able to engage with their peers and others and feel like they're really at home in, at school. And to that end, you know, we just heard Michelle say that students are saying they do not enjoy the online virtual learning as much and don't feel like they're benefiting as much. Oscar, what do you think all of these trends say about, you know, the, the value of online learning, particularly at the college level? Uh, I think it's interesting in that uh, I think those of us in, in higher education have been um, perhaps a little bit lax in trying to to share what our value proposition is with, with families and and um, it, it's a bit of a challenge, right? For for many many years, we spent all this time trying to to build up campus and campus community and, and the value of of being in person in these spaces um, in order to help draw students and. And um, when when we were faced with a pandemic where we were all forced to move uh, on, online, we, we found that us uh, all that all that marketing and all that conversation, all those conversations we were having with families about the benefits of being on our campuses with our uh, faculty, with those other students, uh, it, it perhaps came back to, uh, to to hurt us a bit, right? Yeah. We, we haven't uh, quite gotten back to. To, to get into what the fundamentals of what a higher education is supposed to be. Right. And, and it's difficult you know, to, obviously, yeah, it's difficult to, to make it work the same way you would on campus. That's where we'll have to leave it, though. My thanks to Michelle Brown, Anish Sahoni, and Oscar Rodriguez for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And now, Paris, we toss it back to you. Thanks, Brandis. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, Russia's President Vladimir Putin in the spotlight as President Biden warns of enormous consequences if Russia invades Ukraine. Recently captured video of Chicago shows the city from hundreds of miles above. What was the photo photographer's method? NASA can help explain. The crab beer community is, it, it's, it's one of those communities, there's literally something for everyone. A new scholarship aims to brew a more inclusive craft beer industry. And Jeffrey Bayer takes us back to when Chicago was known as the Detroit of bicycles in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. But first, some more of today's top stories. Cook County opioid overdoses for 2021 are set to surpass 2020's numbers. As of today, just over 1,600 opioid-related deaths have been confirmed for last year, with 717 cases still pending. It is estimated the final count of opioid-related deaths will surpass 2,100 cases in 2021. That's in comparison to over 1,800 deaths in 2020. Cook County Health was recently awarded more than $2 million to improve access to treatment for people struggling with opioids and substance abuse disorders. One down, one to go for the Bears. The team has reportedly hired a new general manager, and in fact, they just made it official this evening. He is Ryan Poles, who most recently worked as the executive director of player personnel for the perennial Super Bowl contending Kansas City Chiefs. Poles was met last night at O'Hare by team chairman George McCaskey and reportedly accepted the job late this morning. Poles replaces former general manager Ryan Pace, who was let go after seven seasons. Poles now has the job of finding the team's next head coach and has reportedly set up meetings with a handful of finalists. Chicagoans are in store for a bone-chilling wind chill of 25 below zero tonight. That's a season low for Chicago. The National Weather Service has issued a wind chill advisory for northern Illinois tonight through noon tomorrow. The city is advising people seeking access to warming centers or experiencing insufficient heat to contact 311 for immediate assistance. 8,500 U.S. troops are on high alert in Eastern Europe as President Joe Biden has called a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine imminent. Russian President Vladimir Putin has escalated troop action, but Ukraine's leaders are urging calm right now. Biden today says the geopolitical stakes of a Russian invasion couldn't be higher. There will be enormous consequences if he were to go in and invade, as he could, the entire country. He enormous consequences worldwide. This would be the largest, if he were to move in with all those forces, it would be the largest invasion since World War II. It would change the world. And joining us now with more are Julian Haida, a Ukrainian-American journalist who now has residency in Ukraine. Haida previously was a producer for Worldview on WBEZ and is scheduled to return to Ukraine on Saturday. Ian Kelly, the ambassador in residence at Northwestern University. Kelly was United States ambassador to Georgia from 2015 to 2018. Prior to that, he was the U.S. ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And John Huko, a Ukrainian-American lawyer who helped assist the Ukrainian parliament draft its first post-Soviet 
Constitution. We welcome all of you here to Chicago tonight. Uh, Ambassador Kelly, what would those consequences be should Russia invade Ukraine? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because today the White House, a couple of senior officials, um, outlined uh, what these painful consequences would be. And they would, um, I think, uh, affect the energy sector, which, of course, is their biggest source of income, but also uh, exports of uh, high tech technology, which uh, Russia and many other countries, of course, depend on our uh, Silicon Valley uh, technology. But I think that the, um, uh, the, the real impact is going to be the impact on markets in Russia. The stock market yesterday lost in Russia and Moscow lost 7% of its value just from the threat of, uh, of sanctions like these. 77%, that's a giant uh, chunk of its no, value. Uh, 7%. Oh, 7%, 7 I thought you said 77%. Okay, 7% is <laughs> still not great. Uh, John Huco, knowing the region as you do, do you believe that an invasion is imminent or could this be a bluff? I think when we look at the situation, we need to sort of step back and, and sort of what is the big picture here? And people talk a lot about NATO expansion and, and Putin feeling encircled, et cetera. But I think if we really step back, the key issue here is Putin wants to, in my view, destroy Ukraine as an independent sovereign state. And it needs to do this for, for two reasons. One is the historical. If you read the article that he uh, published last July, where he sort of makes the erroneous, in my view, uh, historical case for Ukraine not being a people, not being a country, there's no historical basis on which Ukraine should be an independent country. Um, you realize that for him, it's about recreating the Soviet Union, recreating the Soviet uh, Russian Empire, and taking back Ukraine, which he views as part and parcel of, of Russia. And the second reason is that an independent, vibrant Ukraine uh, is a huge danger to his own power and to what's happening in Russia. If you look at Ukraine over the last 30 years, I think all of us that follow it closely are disappointed that perhaps on corruption and other issues that hasn't moved as quickly as we would have hoped. But Ukraine is a democracy. It has a free press. It has a very strong civil uh, society. Minority rights are respected. They've had six different people be president over the last 30 years. And so for Putin, this is about destroying Ukraine as an independent country, or at least in the worst case, turning it into a vassal state. And it's based on a historical premise that's erroneous in my view, and on the fact that he can't afford to have an independent, vibrant Ukraine. And, and Ukraine leadership uh, that, is, that has talked about its desire to join NATO and to have sympathy for uh, Western nations. Uh, Julian Hayden, uh, President Biden has talked about more sanctions, uh, uh, sending arms and supplies to Ukraine. Is there anything diplomatically that can be done to deter uh, military invasion at this point? Um, you know, I think that um, time will tell, which is not an answer that 45 million Ukrainians want to hear. Uh, this is a, a war that they have been living through uh, over the last eight years. Granted, it's been a frozen conflict, but a, a conflict no less. Um, and uh, sanctions um, have had uh, mixed success. So, you know, what I, what I think uh, the people of Ukraine most want is peace. They want what anybody wants. And, and the way you get to that is, um, as you can imagine, a source of, 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 of great argument. Now, many Ukrainians are, are very happy with the fact that the U.S. Uh, has supported uh, Ukraine, especially since Ukraine made the rather bold move to turn away from Russia after a popular uprising in 2013 and 2014. Um, and uh, now they're looking around at the countries that uh, promised them support. Ukraine gave up the, one of the largest nuclear arsenals in the world uh, in exchange for specifically American, but also Russian uh, defense. And uh, now uh, they're, they're looking around and, and, and feeling kind of lonely in the world. So they're, they're grateful for uh, uh, American support, but the way that peace will be reached is um, I think a, a really big question, but it's a question that is mostly front of mind for um, I think most of, of, of the Ukrainian population. Whether or not there'll be an invasion or not, that is, you know, that is something that um, you know there's a lot of uh, discussion over and in Ukraine. But Ukrainian ahead. leaders have urged calm, saying that that the population shouldn't uh, get all uh, fortified for some kind of invasion right now. Ambassador Kelly, what appetite is there among NATO countries, including the U.S., for 
some kind of uh, military conflict uh, to assist Ukraine and Russia, noting that there are countries like Germany that have that have stayed relatively neutral to this point. Yeah, I wouldn't say Germany's neutral, but I think that we're we're not uh, really encouraged by uh, their uh, extreme reluctance to sign on to some of the more uh, some of the more painful economic sanctions. I, you know, I I I think that it's really kind of a matter of of degrees in, in terms of um, Europe, uh, what what kinds of sanctions they want. And I think there's also a a difference between those who think that a strong response um, will um, will deter Putin and those who think that um, that a strong response is escalatory and you know can make the situation even more tense. I think the United States and the United Kingdom and some of the Eastern European countries believe that um, a half measures or a weak response, uh, it actually encourages uh, more aggression. Uh, but I think that there are a number of people in Central Europe, particularly in, in Germany and France, who really kind of see it see it the opposite way uh, right. and are looking uh, to not do uh, measures that they see as escalatory and we see as, uh, as deterrence. So certainly a high-level chess match here. What about... Uh... Uh, John Huco, the stakes back in the U.S., we know that Russia has been very active in cyber and hacking operations, the 2016 election. What could the consequences be on those fronts? Well, again, I think going back to the, the issue of, of whether Putin is going to invade or not, I'd just like to make a quick point that uh, I think it's, it's, it, there's a binary decision for him to make. He either there's an off-ramp, a diplomatic off-ramp, or if, in fact, the goal here is really to destabilize and turn Ukraine into a, a vassal state, he can't, if he's going to do an incursion, it can't be a, a minor incursion because he's going to incur the full wrath of Western sanctions with very, very little gain. He could try to take a, back a portion of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, but that's not going to get him enough. So if he does make a move, it's got to be big enough to really make a difference in terms of destabilizing Ukraine and getting to his ultimate, to his ultimate goal. Obviously, that's going to have repercussions for him. But it'll, you know, obviously he has weapons that he could use against us in terms of cyber attacks, getting involved in our elections, et cetera. And that's something obviously we need to prepare for. And I'm sure the administration is looking at how are we going to counter his countermeasures to, to, to Western sanctions. And, and Julian Haida, you, you talked about how the population in Ukraine feels right now. How prepared are they for military invasion and, and how well can they withstand an extended military operation? <laughs> Well, you know, I think if, if you know, uh, military analysts have said that Russia would need very many more soldiers than it currently has on Ukraine's border to occupy the country, uh, I, I don't uh, think that that would be the case. But that also, as John mentioned, might not be the goal. The goal might very well just be to destabilize Ukraine to the point that Ukraine um, can, it can become more submissive to Russia and kind of be absorbed back into that Soviet uh, space that Vladimir Putin wants to recreate. So, you know, it's 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 very difficult um, to, to, to say right now, but there are now uh, citizen rifle training uh, happening. Uh, there are people who are preparing to to fight because it is their livelihoods so, and it's it's what people want and, and they want peace first and foremost, but they want what anybody here in Chicago wants, which is to have a warm house, to have food on the table and um, with all the diplomatic talks that are going on, uh, but that's important. To certainly, keep in mind. certainly escalation happening uh, uh, all over the place here, and we'll have to leave it there for now. Our thanks to Julian Hayda, Ian Kelly, and John Huco. Thank you so much. Thank you. And up next, images of Chicago from hundreds of miles above. But first, we take a look at the weather. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Stunning images of Chicago from hundreds of miles above are circulating on social media. The photographer is none other than the International Space Station. WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley joins us now with details. So, Patty, what exactly did the space station capture of Chicago? 
Yeah, well, it was going overhead, and it, it first image about 10 days ago, it captured one of those classic, you know, satellite views of Chicago coming in from the west where everything's dark, and then you come in on the city, and it's just this explosion of white light. Um, then the next one was from over this weekend, completely different view of a whitened Chicago blanketed in snow, looked like we were in the Arctic or something, which it actually feels like. Yeah, and I think I think the space station actually tweeted Chicago that it looks cold. Fact check, yes. it, is. Um, it is. So if the station can see us, can we see the station? We can, if we know where and, and when to look and the conditions are just right. But it actually orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes because it's going so incredibly fast. Um, we can see it when it's overhead at dusk or dawn so sometimes it's overhead and we can't see it and it needs to be kind of high enough on the horizon so it needs to kind of be like a perfect storm of conditions for us to be able to see it but yeah it's bright up there um when the, those conditions are just right all right i imagine it helps for it to be clear uh for us to look up and see <laughs> you it you know well. you know that's always the trick here. yeah that's always the trick all Good right <laughs> patty wetley thanks so much thanks brandis and you can read Patty's full story on our website where you'll find a link to the date, time, and position in the sky to look for the station. It's all at WTTW.com news. Beer is intended to be for everyone of drinking age, of course, but it's not always made by everyone. The craft beer industry has historically been dominated by white men. A 2021 survey by the Brewers Association, which represents thousands of breweries nationwide, found more than 93 percent of brewery owners are white and about 76 percent are men. That lack of diversity is the inspiration behind a new scholarship initiative in Illinois. Craft beer has something for everyone, and it's important that that message is pushed forward. Jay Westbrook is one of three winners of a new diversity scholarship created by the Illinois Craft Brewers Guild. The goal is to build a more inclusive industry by giving underrepresented groups access to education and technical training. Drinking beer together is a way to share a sensory experience, to celebrate life events, to um, break liquid bread together. But when we looked at the community um, that craft beer is nurtured, whether it's at beer fests or in tap rooms or on our own production floors, it was pretty clear to us that there was a distinct lack of diversity. The scholarship is a partnership with the Siebel Institute of Technology, a brewing school in Chicago. It covers either an entry-level or intermediate-level brewing course, a value of up to $4,000. Westbrook has been brewing his own beer for about two years now and hopes the new training and knowledge will take his passion to the next level. I've always had a love and a fascination for craft beer, but uh, once I got into the service industry, I became even more fascinated with how it was made and how it was created. Westbrook has created four beers so far, including Harold's 83 Honey Ale, which you can find at Haymarket Pub and Brewery in Westtown. Harold's 83 Honey is definitely a hat tip to Harold Washington becoming the first African-American mayor of the city of Chicago back in 1983. It's also a hat tip to uh, Harold Baines, who also had a really good 1983, as I am a White Sox fan. And it's also a hat tip to a Chicago institution in Harold's Chicken. It's not just about beer for Westbrook. He also wants to inspire other beer makers of color and tell a story with each creation. For instance, my summer 54 project that I did with a baseball historian, Shakia Taylor, told the story of the friendship between Ernie Banks and Minnie Minoso. That mission to educate and affect change is a big part of why the Illinois Craft Brewers Guild says they chose Westbrook. He had a lot to say about how he really wants to be like a beacon of diversity and equity and inclusion and that he wants to use craft beer to affect positive change in the community. I'm very much a purpose driven brewer, so there's always going to be a philanthropic aspect to the beers that I brew, as well as a storytelling aspect. I'm very proud of the city that I'm from and I want to tell stories about my city through craft beer because the easiest way to get someone's attention to get them to listen to you is to put a proper drink in their hand. And Westbrook's Harold's 83 Honey can also be found at most Chicago area Benny's locations, as well as several liquor stores. Up next, an encore edition of Ask Jeffrey. Ask Jeffrey is brought to you in part by BMO Harris Bank.
Okay. Ah, uh, can you get this? I don't have my wallet. Oh, really? It's funny how that always happens. Yeah, it's fine. With BMO Harris, you don't need your wallet. You can get money from any BMO ATM using your phone. Uh-oh, looks like someone can buy their own tacos. Okay. You could also pay them back with Zelle. So many ways for you to pay. Yeah, you know what? I'm not hungry. I'll just have some of yours. Order for BMO. Ooh, tacos, banking. Some things are made to be mobile. That feeling you get when your phone is your wallet, that's the BMO effect. Bicycle sales in Chicago have surged over the past year as the pandemic has forced more and more people outside for exercise and recreation. But it's hardly the city's first bike boom. Jeffrey Baer is here to take us back to when Chicago was called the Detroit of bicycles in this week's Ask Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, this week's question is, what is the history of the old Schwinn factory on Costner Avenue on Chicago's northwest side? Well, that's a great question. We may be flirting with sub-zero temperatures this week, but there are still those dedicated few cycling through the ice and slush to remind us of the surge in cycling that we've seen this past year. In fact, the origins of modern cycling can be traced back to our city of Chicago. Uh, the building in question on Costner Avenue in Chicago's Hermosa neighborhood was once one of the factories owned by the Schwinn Bicycle Company, at one time one of the largest bicycle manufacturers in the entire United States. As you mentioned, Brandis, the company's origins date back to the great bicycle boom of the late 19th century. Bikes were finally becoming accessible to everyday people, largely due to the advent of the modern bicycle chain in the 1870s. Before our so-called safety bicycles of today, uh, most bikes um, had those enormous front wheels and were quite expensive. Uh, they were called penny farthings or ordinaries. And let me tell you, I rode one in our show, Biking the Boulevards, and it does take a lot of leg power and it felt pretty wobbly and that's a long way down if you fall. Uh, by the 1890s, the Chicago region had more than 80 manufacturers, which collectively cranked out two thirds of the country's bicycles, many in factories along Lake Street in today's Fulton Market. That's where the first Schwinn factory was. I was at the corner of Lake and Peoria. And the company at that time was known as Arnold Schwinn and Company, two different last names. Um, but the person behind it all was really this guy, Ignaz Schwinn, uh, the short man on the right in this promotional picture. Um, Schwinn made racing bikes, but they also made pleasure cruisers like this tandem bike dating from the 1890s. That's a nice handling of the penny farthing, uh, Jeffrey. So <laughs> how did Schwinn stick out amongst, you know, the other dozens of bike manufacturers in Chicago? Uh, well, the short answer is the others went out, went, went out of business. Um, the bicycle boom went bust in the early 1900s due to market oversaturation and, of course, the rise of the automobile. Um, Schwinn had positioned himself to stay in business thanks to creative marketing and lucrative business partnerships like his relationship with the mail order giant Sears, which shipped Schwinn bikes across the country. Um, in 1901, Ignatz moved his factory to that Costner Avenue facility our questioner asked about. And a few years later, Schwinn opened this much larger factory uh, a few blocks away, and that would stay open until the early 1980s. Um, after World War II, Ignatz's son launched a reimagined line of bicycles appealing mostly to kids and teenagers. In the 60s and 70s, the coolest kids had the Stingray, remember this, with the banana seat and the stick shift. Uh, earlier post-war models like the Phantom featured a sleek chrome finish to give it a space age look. Uh, and Schwinn's branding was enormously, rebranding rather, was enormously popular. By the 1950s, this one company, Schwinn, was manufacturing up to a quarter of the bicycles made in the entire United States. Like most kids, my bikes growing up were Schwinn's. Uh, the first one was what you might call a cruiser today. It was shiny black with chrome fenders. I used to deliver my papers with that bicycle. Uh, later on, I had a, a yellow Schwinn Varsity with black handlebar tape. Uh, but my brother was the cooler one of the two of us. He had the Stingray. What? We don't have any pictures of the two of you 
little guys on your bikes when you were smaller. <laughs> I wish I could find one. Of course. How convenient for you, Jeffrey. So, <laughs> Schwinn is still a household name, uh, but they're no longer based in Chicago, right? Oh, that's right. Starting in the 1970s, unfortunately, um, Schwinn was pretty slow to um, react to several changes in the bicycle market, um, as well as the rise of, of international competitors. Uh, and then by the 90s, the 1990s, Schwinn had filed for bankruptcy and sold off the brand. Um, Schwinn's today are made overseas, uh, except for this one model, a limited run of the Collegiate uh, manufactured in Detroit. Um, as our questioner pointed out, there are still remnants of the company in Chicago, like that building on Costner, um, which is actually now home to a company that uh, brews cider. It's called a cidery. Um, and you can still see vintage sh Chicago-made Schwinn's all over town, although usually in warmer months. This sweet 1974 varsity actually belongs to WTTW photographer Felix Mendez, who often shoots stories for Chicago Tonight. He sure does. Felix's bike. Learn something new about him every day. Jeffrey Baer, yeah, thanks yeah. as always. My pleasure. And don't forget that you can visit our website for more details about the Schwinn Bicycle Company. And while you're there, don't forget to submit your own question to Jeffrey Baer. That's at WTTW.com slash Ask Jeffrey. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. City Council members meet for the first time this year. What measures will older people take up? And a Pilsen Boutique brings Mexican handmade clothing designs to pet owners in Chicago. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and warm and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.